Hey everybody, today I'm talking about another 10 games that I consider to be underappreciated. So the reason I'm making this list is because I always find that the board game media usually talk about the same kind of games again and again. I never see people talking about these games. And even though most of these games are generally pretty positively received, um, I just wanted to spread a bit more awareness about them because um, I think they deserve a bit more spotlight. So uh, let's get started with the first game. So first off, I'm going to talk about Trismegistus. Now Trismegistus is a bit of a strange one to talk about because the designer, Daniele Toshini, is one of the most prolific and um, most popular designers out there today. Um, mostly known for his other games such as Zulkin, such as um, Teotihuacan and Tekenyu. And Trismegistus is almost like the, um, the black sheep of that group of games. Um, it's kind of like an unofficial version of that T series. And because it kind of has a bit of a disconnect in terms of the theme where these other games have a kind of an ancient civilization kind of um, skin on them. Whereas this one has a uh, kind of more of a fantastical uh, alchemical vibe to it as you are trying to manipulate all these different kind of ingredients trying to um, make these potions and experiments to get victory points. And in addition to that, this one is a step up in terms of its complexity and its depth to these other titles as well. So I suppose in that regard, it is going to kind of funnel down into being more of a niche game. But that being said, I don't think the jump is that drastic and it does have a lot of things that I think a lot of people would enjoy if people only knew about this one. Um, it's a dice strapping game, which is a, a kind of a genre which Toshini is known for. But this one uses a whole different dimension of dice drafting, as not only are you considering the symbols on these dice, you are considering how many dice are in that pool, and also the colour of those dice as well. And you only get a few turns in this game, because I think it's like three rounds of three drafts. And you've got to really squeeze all the mileage you can out of every single dice draft in order to manipulate your player board to get your engine rolling by getting these upgrades and just fulfill as many experiments as you can and try to uh, fulfill your master experiment as well or your, your masterpiece. Uh, it's a real brain racking game. It certainly is a brain burner. It gets you thinking in a whole different um, light than you would, you're probably used to. But uh, even though it's difficult, it does. It is, you know, it is um, exhausting. It's so much fun, and it can be so satisfying when you do things right and line your turns up the right way. It also has a good element of player interaction as well, as you are not only fighting over the same dice, but also you can piggyback off other people's um, drafts. So I, I like the way that it does kind of uh, kind of mitigate the downtime in terms of when it's other players' turns, you're still invested. Uh, this is one of my favourite games of all time. Uh, I think it's absolutely magnificent and um, I just enjoy it so so much and I'll play this one absolutely anytime so um, I would highly recommend you check this game out and I would be a bit skeptical of some of the criticisms this game receives because I know it does get a bit of criticism in terms of its graphic design because there are a few minor flaws that I think have been blown out of proportion and um, people do say that the you know the rules overhead is a bit overwhelming at first and I would say that's true somewhat because of some of the um, the terminology the game uses but once you get past that it's just a breeze to play and it's relatively um, streamlined after you get that get that sorted. So um, highly, highly recommend this deep, heavy, strategic game. It's just wonderful. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is Firenze. Now Firenze is by designer Andreas Stedding, who is most known for Hansa Teutonica. Um, I suppose that one almost overshadows a game like um, Firenze. But Firenze was a game that I was after for a long, long time because it's out of print. It was out of print for a long time, but I think it's back in print now. And uh, this one is a game about tower building as you are trying to collect bricks by drafting them off this um, row of cards. And whenever you take these bricks, you've also got to consider the card you're taking as well, because something will happen when you take that card, and it'll be things such as uh, maybe increasing your capacity to store more bricks, or it could even be negative things, such as giving you negative points, or smashing a tower down, or, um, or even attacking other players. And it has this, probably one of the best implementations of a kind of incentive builder that I've ever seen, where you have a row of cards, and every time you um, want to take a card that isn't the first one in that row, you have to deposit a, a brick on that one, which makes the incentive gain or grow and grow for the other players to take even the negative cards. So I, I love that mechanism, and it's one of my favorites. But on top of that, you've got some real tension in this game, as every round you're gonna to have to contribute to the towers you're already building, or otherwise they're going to half in size. And it really is a kind of a race to get these higher towers built, uh, to collect the most bricks and cash them in to fulfill these contracts. 
Um, but I do love that card play. It can be pretty nasty, um, so bear that in mind if um, that's something you're against. But if you're really against that, you can just, just take those cards out. But I just love the way this game feels. It feels a bit more, or quite unique in terms of uh, being unlike anything else I can think of. Um, and it's just a real nice midweight Euro that I enjoy any time. So that is Forense. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is something very different. This is more of a light party negotiation style game called Tifa Tashin, or later re-implemented by a game called Good Critters. Now, this is one of my favourite party games, um, particularly good if you have higher player counts and you're six plus players. And it's a game about trying to um, get as much money as you can and try and negotiate these good deals. Because at least in the Tifa Tashin version of the game, you are uh, you have one player who's the president, and that president is going to draw a number of checks off this um, big pile of money, and then they're going to divide divide that money out however they see fit amongst all the players. You can um, kind of argue and put your case to the president to try and get most money, and all the other players are going to play cards simultaneously to decide whether they're going to agree with the president or uh, disagree with the pres president and try to overthrow him and get a new president in power. Or you can bribe other players to vote certain ways or you can blackmail other players. And this is just a, creates a great uh, dynamic game as you are constantly trying to keep people on side but maybe you're trying to alienate some people and not give them any money and just have your little inner circle of people who are just completely filling your bank up. It's just a wonderful game with some great tension as you can catch people off guard and overthrow the president and um, as I said probably one of the best examples of a negotiation game that I've ever played. So if you do have that higher player count uh, group and you want something a bit different, a bit more um, a bit more boisterous and you have a kind of an outgoing group, then I would highly recommend giving Tifa Tashin a try. Or again, if um, if you can't get your hold on this version, which I think is out of print, um, check out Good Critters because it's exactly the same game, just with a different theme. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is Council of Four, which is another Daniel Itoshini game, but this time with uh, Simone Luciani. This one... Um, much like uh, Tristan Justus being much heavier than his usual game, this one is a bit lighter than his usual game. So I really do consider this a great entry level Euro style game as you are trying to build these routes by uh, kind of matching cards for these different councils, almost like in a, uh, a ticket to ride style way as you're collecting these different colors of cards and then taking actions and putting your pieces onto the board and getting rewards. But the cool thing about this game and probably one of my favorite examples of that almost uh, snowballing effect or getting those um, combinations is when you start building in one town and then you build in connecting towns, you start to compound your rewards where, and you can end up taking big, meaty, powerful turns. But if you don't want to do that, you can kind of diverse yourself and try to spread yourself over the map and get points that way as well by being the first to get into a certain number of cities. Uh, I love the flow of this game. All the turns are extremely quick. Um, it's it's a bit more lucky than his usual style game, but if that's something that doesn't deter you, then I would highly recommend to check this one out. It's a lightweight Euro game, kind of a, or a mid, mid lightweight Euro game that's easy to teach, but it's still fun and it has some interesting decisions. And it has a real dynamic board state as well, as these councils are constantly changing and, um, you know, either deliberately or inadvertently changing the councils to affect other players. And it's really fun, and the come on version has a great table presence as well, as you have these pretty um, superfluous, but nonetheless lovely looking miniatures. That is Council of Four. Uh, the next game I'm gonna talk about is a game called Gentas. Now, Gentas, I think the people who play Gentas tend to have, kind of have quite strong feelings towards how good this game is. Um, and I do think this is a pretty much a, a tick or boxes style Euro game, as you are taking actions, almost in a worker placement style manner, but reversing that where you don't actually put your workers on the board you're taking tokens off the board and putting them onto your player board and all these actions take a certain amount of time which is my the thing i really to take away from this game is this really great time mechanism where whenever you take a certain action you also have to take a certain number of hourglasses depending on how quickly you were to get there and they're going to block off the different actions that you can take per turn. So if you want to get a very particular action, that might take a lot of time and limit your ability to do anything else. And I think that's fantastic. And the idea is you're trying to collect these cards, trying to build these different buildings, um, and just trying to get as many points as you can, getting a bit of an engine built up as well. Um, and just it has a real uh, cool market system as well as you're trying to collect all these different professions, trying to increase your um, almost capacity to fulfill these different objectives. And it just is a lovely, classy looking game that I think is, um, again, almost like a, 
there's no holes in this game. It's a, a very complete Euro game. And if you like the deluxe version, uh, del deluxe games, this one has one of the best deluxe versions that I've ever seen in terms of how lavish and how well produced this game is. It's just a lovely game and I'd highly recommend. That is Gentus. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is, again, probably falling into that lighter to mid-weight um, bracket. This is Museum. Now, Museum, I think, is a great family game, not only because it is uh, got a lovely theme and premise to it, where you are trying to collect these different artefacts, which are all depicted by the cards, with amazing artwork by Vincent Dutre, probably some of the best artwork out there. In fact, probably the best illustrated game I've ever seen. Um, as you're collecting all these different artifacts from all different kind of civilizations, different histories, different parts of the world, and you're trying to basically fill up your museum in different um, different sets, I suppose, by other doing them by their not only by their um, by their nationalities and the different parts of the world they're from, but also by the different types of um, kind of genres they're from. So it could be like a, a militaria or nautical artifacts or, um, you know, maybe scientific kind of artifacts. And it really is a nice puzzle as you are trying to lay these out. You're trying to not only, you're just trying to fit as many collections as you can together in the most harmonious way to get these huge co uh, set collection bonuses. And um, I did do a uh, top 10 set collection games and this one was number one because I think this was all the game is about. There's not much to it other than a bit of hand management as not only are the cards you're playing you want to keep back in order to play them in the first place, but they're also your currency in order to do things, which is a really neat mechanism. But in terms of the table presence and striking artwork, and just being a nice, breezy, fun game, then I really do recommend Museum. Uh, the next game I'm going to talk about is a game I actually talk about quite a bit on the channel, but nonetheless, still one I consider being underappreciated. This one is The Palaces of Carrara. Now, The Palaces of Carrara is a game that I think in English is not so easy to get hold of nowadays, but if you do find a, a, a different language version of this game, I would still recommend you pick this one up because it is pretty, uh, it's near enough completely language independent, and once you know the rules, it's pretty easy to understand and you don't need to read anything. Uh, but this one is a game where you are trying to collect bricks of all these different qualities. So you've got like your really um, polished, amazing uh, white bricks. So you've got the maybe cheaper black bricks. Um, and the idea is you're trying to collect them or this really cool resource wheel where the longer you leave things, the cheaper they become. But not only for yourself, but the other players as well. So you have to have this kind of idea in your head whether am I willing to rotate this wheel, not only make things cheaper for me, but also making them cheaper for my opponent. So that's cool in the first place, but I love the way this game is boiled down into three extremely simple actions, either taking the bricks, you're going to build a building with these bricks and put them into these different cities, or you're going to score a separate city. And when you score these cities, you are actually locking other players out from scoring those cities. So it has this chicken effect where you want to be the first to score something to make sure that you're not locked out of it, but you still want to get those big multipliers to make sure you've got enough built in order to actually get some value out of doing that. Um, a great streamlined, elegant game. I think a great, um, pet, well, from a great pedigree of designers being Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling. And this, I think, is a, a great example of how they've boiled down a pretty meaty game into just a few simple actions. Easy to digest, but it has some compelling decisions and an interesting pacing as well, um, because... Um, the end game scoring is very weird and it changes from game to game where um, depending on the setup based on all these different cards it's going to change um, every time and um, that can really throw a spanner in the works to make you either speed things up or take things slower so it is a bit dynamic in that sense and it does keep you on your toes from start to finish. That is the Palaces of Carrara. The next game I'm going to talk about is Tumbletown. Now, Tumbletown is actually made by the same designer as Calico um, and came out roughly the same time, but it's quite interesting to see how Calico really did blow up and became massive hit and, um, and Tumbletown really did fly under that radar and didn't get much buzz at all. And I think a big part of that is maybe the visual aspect isn't quite as strong with this one. I think the artwork is questionable, but the game mechanisms themselves are extremely accessible, fun, and very family friendly. This is a dice drafting game, or sorry, dice driven game, as you are trying to collect these cards, which are depicting these different buildings, uh, which require different, uh, different criteria to fulfill those cards and get victory points. Um, and these different requirements are things such as not only the different bricks which you need or the different colours of materials which are all depicted by dice, but all the buildings might need a different things such as saying, you know, all your dice to make this building need to come above 
uh, or total above 12, or they need to become exactly eight, or it needs to be a one, two, and a three to make this building. And when you're trying to fill these cards, you're actually physically building them with dice, and you're placing them on your little town mat, which will give you more victory points if you fill up these spots. And further or on top of that, the, um, the more kind of buildings you're building, not only are going to give you the victory points, but they're also going to give you more mitigation tools to use going forward, such as you know, re-rolling dice or um, maybe converting one dice into another couple of dice. And that all works really well. It's quick. It's, again, very breezy. And I think it ticks all the boxes in terms of being um, games that normally blow up and become massive hits because it's so family friendly, but it's engaging enough for um, you know, more seasoned gamers to play as well. Uh, it's got a nice theme to it, but as I said, maybe could have done with a bit more of a revamp in terms of its artwork because it feels a little bit amateurish, a little bit, um, a little bit prototype-ish uh, in terms of its visual aspect. But the game mechanics themselves are fantastic, and um, I think it is just a lovely game. That is Tumble Town. The next game I'm going to talk about is Blackout Hong Kong by Alexander Pfister, who you may recognise from games such as Great Western Trail, Maracaibo, Mombasa. And this one I think is as strong, if not stronger, than a couple of those designs. Uh, this is a game where you are trying to play cards in different slots, you're trying to fulfil these objective cards, you can build up a bit of an engine as you are searching around for these different navigation tokens, you are trying to connect cities together and to get these completion bonuses, to get these big amped up, almost like a set collection method, um, get points in lots and lots of different ways in this game. Um, I think some of the, the reasons why this game didn't take off like the other ones did is because the, the visual aspect of the game is it's very dark, I mean, as you probably expect with a game called Blackout Hong Kong, you know, the game is near enough all blacked out, you know, all the borders extremely dark in blacks and greys. Um, but I, I actually do like the visual aspect of the game, but I can see why some people wouldn't. And it does have a lot of elements that, you know, a big, big hit Fista games have, such as the card play from uh, Mombasa, where you're um, blindly or kind of uh, simultaneously placing cards down these different rows or different columns and then uh, revealing them at the same time and activating them in different orders to get like, resources, to convert goods into other goods, to unlock new cards. And um, I love the way that you have to manage that system because at the end of every turn, you can only start taking cards back from certain columns you've played on. So you can't just keep playing all the best cards together because you're going to really dilute your deck that way. And that's a really innovative mechanism that I enjoy quite a bit. But on top of that, I just love the way everything comes together in this game. It's just, it just has a nice vibe to it. It also, I suppose in the, maybe one of the hindrances that people don't like is that it does feel quite formulaic in terms of being broken down into very procedural round by round by round. You know, in phase one you do this, in phase two you do this. And I can see why that does good disconnect people somewhat, but I think the playables do a good job of smoothing that out. And once you get your head around a turn or two, it does play pretty smoothly. And I just like the way everything comes together in this game. It's got a real satisfying engine building mechanism. Some of them aren't the most innovative in terms of, sorry, uh, intuitive in terms of the things you do in the game, such as um, you know, searching the different regions. But despite that, the gameplay is rock solid. It's really fun. And it, for me, it just ticks all the boxes what I want from an Alexander Fister game. And um, as I said, it's definitely as strong as um, his other designs. And I can't see why this one hasn't taken off like the others have. And the final game I'm going to talk about this episode is Crossed Words. Now, Crossed Words is a party game, and I think one of the best party games I've played in a long time, as you have this three by three grid. On one axis, you've got a bunch of categories. On, a, on the other axis, you've got a bunch of categories as well, um, such as maybe animals or superheroes or um, you know cartoon characters. It might even be a colour or starting with a certain letter. And you're trying to find out or trying to place a word in between those two axes. So you know, if you had like an animal on one axis and a colour on the other axis, you might put something like a, a red panda on that section. And everyone's writing down on these um, dry erase boards and putting them down together. And it really is a race to try and get all your answers in before the time runs out. And it's just so much fun how creative you can be with this game. You can really um, find yourself thinking, you know, how the hell am I going to think of an answer for this? And something just pop up in your brain and you'll be really happy with what you come up with. And I also love the um, element of table talk in this game because you know, the, game, the rounds only take five minutes or so to play. And it's really interesting to see what other people come out with and just discussing whether you think it's a legal answer or not. And I think it just is a, a wonderful party game that I could see really taking off if people only knew about it because... 
I know uh, games like Codenames and that are so just immensely, immensely popular and um, really have become a household name, but I can't see why a game like Crossed Words can't reach those heights either because Again, it, it just is a fantastic part of the game that anybody can understand, and it does cater for anybody. So definitely check this one out if you have, um, you know, if you if you do enjoy your party games. And this one even scales well as well, whereas a lot of party games don't. And this one scales extremely well for even like three players up. So yeah, highly highly recommend Crossed Words. So that concludes this episode of 10 Underappreciated Games. I hope there's something on here that's piqued your interest and I'd highly recommend giving it a bit of a, a deeper dive if, you are, if anything has kind of, you know, perked up your interest. So uh, if you have enjoyed the video, please hit like and subscribe to my channel and check out my other videos too. For everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.